Matthew, can you hear me? Testing, testing, one, two, three. Hello? Yeah, can you see me? Yes, I can see you, now I can hear you. Okay. Can you see me, hear me? Can see you. All right, there All right. we go. Yay. All right, hey, uh, apologize for Monday. I appreciate your flexibility. No worries. And uh, this is going to be fun, it seems, because we've come through this through a lot of different connections, and uh, let's see what evolves. Yeah. Oh, I was trying to turn on a light, but it doesn't look like that's going to... There we go. Okay. Is my picture too dark? Um, dark. You're fine. You're, you're, the background is brighter than you are, but it's all good. <laughs> so, How's your day going? Oh, I have to write a paper. I was supposed to write it yesterday. and uh, I'm in that uh, same boat. <laughs> I was supposed to get it done yesterday. Haven't even got it done yet. I had to send apologies this morning. Still been working on it today. Actually, I'm impressed with uh, your writing. You actually write very long, uh, very well put together thoughts. I, I saw your identity uh, blog entry. Far, far too long. Yeah. Actually, um, well, without going into all that stuff. Yeah. I, I, after that piece, I tried to tackle a piece on reputation um, coming out of the Rebooting the Web of Trust sort of summit. Mm -hmm. I was kind of going into that summit and then coming out, I sort of took ownership of, um, I was supposed to kind of lead a team basically in crafting this reputation paper and it threw me into like a several months long depression. <laughs> <laughs> I basically got writer's block. I knew what I wanted to say. I totally knew what I wanted to say. I just couldn't sit down and write it. Was and it a collaborative uh, difficulty or was it just a writer's no, block? No, it was a, it was a personal, it was, it was, I didn't, I was stuck for like four months and couldn't do any work basically. And I couldn't figure out what the heck was going on. And I realized eventually, ah, this is the same workaholism stuff that I thought I had dealt with like five years ago. <laughs> you know, I thought I'd handle this already. Um, and it was, it was, it was basically going, Oh, this is, I think I've figured some important things out. I know what I want to say. I have a unique ability to say them. It's my duty to say this stuff and to say it well. Yeah. Right? And then getting wrapped up in perfectionism and all that stuff and being almost mute. Oh, some um, of that stuff, huh? <laughs> all of that stuff, yeah. And so, yeah, that wasn't super fun. But the long story short was like, feels really important, want to say it well. That feels intimidating. Writer's block, start procrastinating going surfing and or New York times or whatever. I have no and, idea what that feels like, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and then feeling ashamed because I'm feeling lazy about procrastinating, feeling ashamed. I'm not confident and don't want to be seen. That was a piece that I hadn't really figured out. Like, uh -huh. Oh, I don't want to be seen because I'm ashamed. And, <laughs> and it was like, Oh, I'm totally stuck because I've kind of backed myself into this weird little corner. Oh, rest assured, you're the only person that feels that way. Oh, no, I know I'm not alone. I know I'm not alone. But no, you are alone. Nobody else feels that way, Matthew. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> um, but I actually had a conversation with Eric um, from Scepter uh, about oh, yeah. two and a half weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And we, he, because I told him, I'm still struggling. My head is not right. And, um, and he asked a good question during that conversation. He was just like, hey, how, how important is duty to you in motivating your work? And I kind of walked through that a little bit. I was like, yeah, it's incredibly important and blah, blah, blah. And, and it allowed me to see all that stuff, basically. It's like, oh, shit, this is just that workaholism stuff. And basically buying into, at some level, that... Um, uh, like it's a subtle shift from, oh wow, I think I have the ability to contribute something significant to if I can contribute something significant, then I will be worthy to I am worthless unless I can contribute something significant. <laughs> and suddenly that makes that whole creative process not a joy-filled play, mm -hmm. but a slog. And, um, and just that, having that conversation was like, ah, oh, okay. So I've been going and playing, but I haven't been able to enjoy it because I'm feeling guilty about not having gotten my work done. What was different about the identity paper that it didn't happen there, but it's happening in the reputation paper? Um, 
deadline was part of it, right? Like I was able to force myself to put my butt in the chair mm -hmm. because the, the day was coming. And in fact, that paper got submitted late. Right, like I, I chained myself to a chair for days on end and like just hammered and hammered. Deadlines are my friend. Unfortunately, the structure of my life is such that I don't have many deadlines. See, for me, my body and my mind misinterprets that word. A deadline yeah. is when I start. Totally, <laughs> totally, right? Um, and, I, and I know why that is at some level, like I get that um, when it's all on the line uh, and there's risk involved, mm -hmm. I'm able to enter a flow state more easily, which literally means you're shutting down parts of your brain, right? And so I'm able to, to be uninhibited. You're literally shutting down portions of your frontal cortex. Um, the part that's aware of yourself and <laughs> does all, all that rational and that like self doubt stuff. Um, and you start drawing much more broadly across um, your bit. You're almost like running on autopilot hmm. in ways. Um, and I use that. I use flow states a ton in surfing, especially surfing big waves. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really easy to access them that in big waves um, in part because the risk is right there. That's right. Um, Until something happens, right? Yeah. And I think that's the role that deadlines, deadlines play. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately un or unfortunately for folks like you and I who work on this stuff, there aren't organizations that do this stuff. Mm, that's right. Really? Yeah, not yet. You know what I mean? Like, like nobody's hiring people to restructure how communities function. Like that's not a, that's, there's no, there's no box, you know, on the, on the, what do you do for work <laughs> thing that right. describes. Or even in such a, uh, a new world, what does hiring someone actually mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm, I'd be curious to get your thoughts on reputation because it's obviously connected to identity. And clearly people who have thought about identity think a lot about reputation. Yeah. And so there's definitely some uh, opportunities to try and uh, address some touch points there as well. Um, I definitely have a bunch of thoughts on reputation and I can dive in, but I'd like to have you steer a bit. Well, there... reputation then involves trust as well, right? Because you really try to get at trust via this reputation concept. It's yeah. not really reputation I really care about, it's the trust. Right. That's right. And it's so from, from this kind of builds on that identity paper. Mm -hmm. um, the reputation that matters reputation is really kind of a misnomer, but it's, it's the closest word that we have um, that gets at all of this stuff in one little nice packaged word. Right. But the it's real package, as you say, it's not nicely packaged because it means this to you. It means that to me. That's right. But it, but it refers to, I think a more accurate word is actually signals. Um, um, in part because in one specific way, when we think of reputation, often we are thinking about almost like a ranking a, that's, that's community wide. <laughs> Jim is the best. This guy's number two. <laughs> you know, and that's not really how reputation works. And that's not even how you use that information. If I no. need somebody that does Java, I want somebody who's good in Java, right? And that reputation, if it's on something else that's even maybe, you know, close to but not exactly Java, does that really apply, you know? So yes. I, I actually like to track re reputation down to it's the ultimate big data problem. Mm. And by big data, I mean you got to look at these individual transactions. You know, if I say I'm going to call you at uh, four o'clock and I don't call you at four o'clock, I get a minus one or a ding or whatever we want to call sure, it. Sure, sure. In, like, in one domain, right? Like in one domain. In one domain, yeah. But if you're yeah. Einstein, it might be like, well, sometimes Einstein's late. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, I still want to, I still am not going to throw out his theories. You right. know? However, I think that's still based on these individual transactions. You know, you can still say, hey, 
the guy was proactive with his communication. He did the right thing. I don't feel bad about it. There was no downside to it. Excuse me, I gotta get rid of this call. No worries. Okay, okay. So, uh, let me turn that off. So, I think where reputation is trying to get at this single metric, you know, unidimensional ranking idea, it's a very rough, very error prone notion. Yeah. I also prefer to say, do I trust this person to take out the trash? Yes. I, I trust that person to take out the trash. Do I trust that person to cut my hair? Yes, I do. Yeah. Do I then have uh, the trust in both directions? No. I don't trust that person to cut my hair. I don't trust that person to you know, take out the trash. That's right. Very so it's attribute specific. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's very action or domain or context specific. Yeah. I can't just yeah. say I trust Matthew, right? I mean, that's, yeah. that takes a lifetime to get to. That's right. And, and, it, it, um, and this is the reason why I like signals rather than reputation. Mm-hmm. Or I, not that I like it, but I think it gets more to that, to that point. As you pointed out, it's a transaction by transaction basis. Right. And it has to do with what are the interactions that we are able to gain awareness of? What are the past interactions that we can get signals from? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, um, and how do we want to weigh those up? What are our priorities? That matter. So like you said, I'm looking for a hairstylist, the guy who's good at taking out trash ain't, you know, that's great. Lovely for you, Mr. Right. You know, trash right. guy, but I don't want you coming near my hair. Exactly. Um, um, and for f- that, that identity paper was largely for the, if somebody's watching this later on, that identity paper, the like big point of that is that the role of identity in a community is, um, is kind of two-sided. It's that one person shows up and they are bringing portions of their history of those interactions, those transactions. And they're basically bringing certifications or recommendations or whatever, but signals from other sources that the person they're looking to interact with um, would find useful or reliable. And so there's one side of, how much of my history do I want to bring into this moment? Mm -hmm. And how much of those communities, those networks, do I want to expose to this thing here? Right? Like I may be doing something that might not be kosher with some of like this, this could be a a hotel clerk somewhere and I'm having an affair and I'm willing to pay cash, you know, and I'm willing to show (laughs) them over 18, but I don't want this on my credit card and I Mm -hmm. don't want them to know my actual name Mm -hmm. um, because my wife, whatever. Right? So, So the person brings in some amount of their history. They're referring to portions of their life. They're making reference to others who can sort of vouch for them in certain ways. That's one half. The other half is the person who they're looking to interact with, what do they need? And and, and that that whole thing happens in both directions, right? Like before I'm willing to buy something from you, I want to make sure that you actually got decent product. Right. Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so that's, that's a whole, as you mentioned, trust, dance. Um, and I'm a big fan of Christopher Allen's um, articulation of, on this around progressive trust. That the way that this stuff actually works is, you know, you take a small risk and um, you see how the person interacts with you. And then you take a slightly bigger risk and you see how they interact with you. And over and over and over and over again. And you eventually build up a, over, in, over rounds of investment, you build up more social capital. You become more willing to, to trust one another. Right. And reputation is largely, both identity and reputation are largely about um, being able to shortcut that process by being able to leverage the previous experience of other members of the community. Right. And it's also the ultimate leap of faith in saying past performance is an indicator of future expectation or, you know, predictability, right? It is, but um, we don't have other things that are better predictors, (laughs) you know, like, and, and, and so the main problem that we end up facing is not that past to future issue, but 
can we trust the past? Is that past real? Um, were the people that I was referring to reliable or have they been bribed in some way or whatever, you know, is that a falsified history that, that ends up being much more, um, I would almost say that's much more of the issue, but the, act, the actuality, in actuality, um, the real issue is that in our modern day communities, the scale at which we operate is so big that there's so much information there um, and the references are so distant um, that it's hard for us to keep track of all of that content. Mm -hmm. and, and even prioritize all the different pieces of information or, or absorb them all. And for me, that's why I'm working with Arthur and Eric on the Scepter project, right? Like I came into this with a vision of how do you build information systems that enable us to do reputation-based, I should say signal-based, not reputation, but signal-based regulation of community. I'm going to have to uh, turn this phone off. No worries. Okay. Let me and, um, you know, they, they didn't, to be totally honest, like they don't come at it from that exact same place. They were coming at it really from a currency perspective with currency being in the signals. Um, they saw that, hey, these signaling systems can improve the functioning of a community. Um, and, and came through that sort of insight, whereas I was coming from a different place and got to the same answer. I was coming from uh, basically, oh, our regulatory systems don't function at the scales that we operate at today, especially global scale. And how can we get to you know, regulatory systems that are able to function the right, right word would be fractally, right? They can function in small groups and larger groups. They can function in things, that, in groups that are sort of overlapping. Um, and uh, yeah, that's kind of what, what led me down this path. A lot of topics here, definitely a lot of topics. Tell me about collaborology. Collaborology is a word that uh, I actually pitched to some of my colleagues maybe three, four or five years ago. Yeah. And surprisingly, I haven't yet been laughed out of town yet. <laughs> for that word. And really the one liner of it is if we're going to have any hope of addressing global or planetary scale issues, I guess one realization is unless we have a tyrant or unless we have this, you know, philosopher king that eventually takes over the entire world, like, you know, Bernie Sanders plus plus or whatever, then we're not likely to have a single traditional hierarchically organized organization that's going to solve the problem. So we have to have autonomous entities that figure out how they align and choose to do things together and yep. do this at scale. So it's really the understanding and, you know, basically principles and practices of how the successful collaboration scale to at least planetary wide and hopefully beyond with autonomous entities. Yeah, that these at both you know very large as well as individual level. Yep, that's really you know what I'm very very interested in. And that is literally the exact same sort of starting point that I came into this stuff from, because for me being a like armchair political philosopher, mm -hmm. right? Um, I was one of my majors in undergrad was political theory. Um, I went to law school. I went to law school knowing I didn't want to practice law. I knew I wanted to kind of work on I basically they, I didn't know the word social entrepreneur at the point at that point but I was a social entrepreneur I still don't know what social entrepreneur is yeah my my gist of it was this when I was in college I thought business was evil mm -hmm. and then right as I was finishing college I realized oh you know what? you can start businesses that actually do good in the world and promote themselves on that basis and um, I got interested in you know building sort of impact oriented organizations and I started a sweatshop free t-shirt company mm -hmm. right um, and without going into all the details there, went to college, went to law school saying, I know I don't want to practice law. I want to work on really changing regulatory institutions at global scale. Like it felt to me like uh, the international system is broken. It doesn't function well. We go to war regularly. We're killing off all the species. Like, you know, all of these things are, are 
symptoms of a non-functioning regulatory system. It's functioning well for somebody. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I disagree. I totally disagree. I think it, it, it um, systems that are poor at regulating themselves can still thrive in the short term. Mm -hmm. But over a long enough period of time, they will collapse because they aren't balancing themselves. And I, I think that we are, um, I think that we are at real risk of that sort of collapse, largely because we're, we're disrupting um, complicated um, ecosystem structures that um, our survival is dependent upon. But without going into all that stuff, right? Like, um, so it, from my perspective, that's all bad math, right? That's like really bad accounting. Like, look, it, it's like the company that shows a huge profit this quarter by screwing over their clients, and three years later, they're out of business, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, all the executives bonused, so they look like they were doing great, but the organism died, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, and if, if you have another company to jump to, that's not a problem. Well, we don't have another species to jump to, Please. right? So, <laughs> um, so it's kind of a problem. So the, the, the long story short for me was um, I had come to the same place that you had come to. I, I had gotten to this place of we're not all going to look to some tablet in the sky and go, yep, we all agree that those are the things that matter. And so for me, the, the driver of this stuff was largely the realization that we're never going to overcome um, religious difference. And that when you do regulation in the traditional way of courts and prisons and police and laws, um, the, who gets to choose the laws and what laws do you pick um, end up being really closely tied to worldview. Um, and we're never going to all align on that worldview. And so I did not see us coming to some global government thing um, ever. Like, <laughs> not, not in the government you know, laws and prisons and military violence I think version of do, government. We're just going to accelerate our uh, impending doom, you know? Yeah, I, the, 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 I don't really want to monopolize all the time here, but the basic gist of it is it took me a long time to be able to articulate this point. Like, it literally took me years before I was able to go, ah, that's it, in a succinct way. And I still haven't really shared this. So maybe this is the maybe this is the, a great first moment. Um, I, I've shared this a little bit in some of the writings on my blog, but not particularly well. Can, you have two ways to influence behavior, right? Regulation is really about balance. It's about steering, and in a community, that means it's about nudging. It's about influencing people to behave in the ways that you want them to behave, right? If you want somebody who's going to um, cut your hair well. You're, you want to be able to influence that a little bit. One, you want to be able to find somebody who's good at cutting hair, and two, you want them to put in the effort to do a good job. Right? Mm -hmm. And communities basically have um, two ways. I, I shouldn't say communities, just individuals, period, humans, have two ways of influencing behavior. One is violence, and the other is what I call access. And violence is, hey, if you don't do what I like, if you do something I don't like, I'm going to hit you with a stick. I'm going to put you in jail. So you attack the body or restrain the body. And access is basically, hey, if you do stuff I like, I'm going to turn towards you. Mm -hmm. And if you do stuff I don't like, I'm going to turn away from you. Mm -hmm. And um, in a violence system, and when, in a, when you are using violence, because most, most communities use both of these tools, right? But when you are using violence, the enforcement action takes place on the body of the quote unquote bad actor. In an access system, the enforcement action takes place on the body of the person or the resource that is going to be provided or, you know, given access to not the body of the, of the individual, but the other bodies. And then that ends up actually setting a very different dynamic with violence because you only have, because the enforcement action takes place on the body, it actually forces the community to come to a single point of view about what's right and what's wrong, at least in terms of what action they take. Because they can't both throw me in jail 
and not throw me in jail. There can't be disagreement expressed at the point of action. But in an access type system, which is a system that uses reputation and individuals being able to decide who they want to turn towards and turn away from and all that kind of stuff. Well, in that system, you could turn away from me. You could go, screw you, Matt. You know, I don't like your use of the word collaborative advantage or collaborative. It should be collaborology. And we have a big feud over, you know, vocabulary and we part ways. Somebody else still may, you know, decide that they want to interact with me. And, um, what that meant for me was, oh, with those tools, you can steer amidst disagreement. You can have people aligning where they feel like there's alignment and gaining the benefit of, of that uh, cooperation, collaboration. And you can have other folks working in a different domain and steering differently. And they can both be okay. They can coexist. It doesn't determine that they will coexist. You know, people are going to get, there's going to be fundamentalists, right? Folks are going to want everyone else to live their way. But um, I've actually never said this before, and the thought just occurred to me. Um, legalistic forms of governance, governance that re revolve, re that relies upon, relies upon a monopoly of violence. So legalistic forms of governance that rely upon a monopoly of violence are fundamentalist. Okay. That is a fundamentalism form of governance because it forces everyone within the community to abide by a single, it, it pretends as if there is a single community, as if there is a fundamental truth, as opposed to enabling there to be a coexistence of multiple communities, disagree, disagreement between those communities, different sets of values. Etc. And at that time, then wouldn't the truth be static or rightness be static? That's right. right. So there's no evolutionary notion of rightness. That's right. Right. And so those, and that's actually the, the big problem that violence based government systems have um, because they tend to be one size fits all like this is right. And this is all wrong. Um, it's really hard for them to change direction. Until January 1, in which case now this is right and that's wrong, and it's going to change on January 1 of the following year. Sure. Yeah, but, it, um, but it, yes, and it changes for the entire community, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the real issue is not, you know, who's pulling the lever and are they able to steer the train onto a different track. The real thing that, that those communities suffer from is they aren't able to try things out right. small, that, that lack of learning, the lack of feedback, the lack of evolutionary notion, right? right? Whereas in an access control community, some nut job out in the periphery tries something mm -hmm. and people are ignoring him for the most part, but then it proves to be actually pretty useful mm -hmm. and other people start doing that and eventually it gains a following and it, and it becomes more common and gains adoption. The community's behavior adapts, right? By the way, your use of terms like collaborative advantage, or let's say violence orientation or legalistic uh, structures, etc., uh, show that <clears throat> there's a suggestion in the back of my mind that says at some point I want to bring up this notion called Dictopedia. And I don't know. Called, called what? Dictopedia. And yeah. Dictopedia is basically a, a framework of a project that tries to recognize that we each travel with our own language, right? And until we know each other relatively well, you know, it might take weeks or hours or minutes or, you know, months to map collaborology into whatever you're talking about yeah. or emergence into accept or access orientation or prescriptive into violence orientation, mm -hmm. or externalism versus blah, blah, blah. Right. So sure. there's sure. a lot of, there's, there's, there's a lot of shared space, but there's, right. uh, there's probably distinction right. because of the different, if we each threw out our mental models, they're probably similar topological models, but the labels on them are different. Totally, right? yeah. And we'd have yeah. to map them, but that's actually a fairly expensive process. And yeah. And it actually says, you know, we're going to have to actually get to know each other a bit to know what you mean by access control, and what do you mean by violence orientation, yeah. what do you mean by competitive, you know, unfair advantage, blah, 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 right? I, I, I uh, commented on a post on Facebook a couple days ago 
uh, I guess sometime last week, and I actually have been meaning to write a follow-up post, but without going into all the details, it's about artificial intelligence and, you know, will they change the world and blah, 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 blah. And um, the long story short was that the, the lady who wrote the post was arguing that... Um, this is Monica? This is Monica, yeah. 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 That, that we can sort of hand off the steering to, to, the, to our artificial and artificially intelligent, you know, uh, assistant, basically. We already have to a large extent. And this sure. Is, again, you know, totally. very, very discussable topic. Yeah. I mean, and literally, we hand over steering to a lot of this intelligence already. <laughs> absolutely. And, 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 you know, that was one of the points that I made in that post. But the point that kind of touches on what you were just saying is, and this was one of the points I made in my, in my original response, uh, in human conversation, much of what we do is building shared meaning. Yeah. That's the point of conversation. Right. You say something, I go, wait, do you mean this? And you go, no, no, not quite like that. It's more like this. And we're coming into alignment with our mental models. So that dictopedia concept, I, uh, my understanding of that is that is what the future of human computer interaction will look like as well. It's going to look a lot closer to human conversation mm -hmm. than it does to, it knows exactly what I mean at all times, right. you know? Um, and, uh, and there's going to be trust issues there too, you know? So um, on the Dictopedia side, that's actually one of the thing, one of the reasons I have similar concepts, different words. Mm -hmm. It's another one of the reasons why I'm excited about Scepter. Um, the semantic sort of foundation for yeah. Scepter, I don't think makes that stuff a, a given. I just think it makes it, um, it makes it so that, as I framed it in one of my early conversations with Arthur and Eric, I was trying to get on the same page with them and know like, what is it they're building and how close is it to what I've been wanting to build? And, mm -hmm. um, and they said, yeah, you know, you, you receive this protocol and, and you can see the, or you see, receive this information, you can see the context that it was with, it within and you can download the protocol. And, and I kind of came back to them with, okay, so really what I'm receiving is the author's understanding of the context yes. and the author's understanding of the protocol. That doesn't mean that's how I have to run it. Right. But those are signals that I can use to help me decide how I want to see that thing. Yes. Right. And, and they were like, yes, yes. And so for, for me, those are tools that, that, um, improve the ability for computers to assist us in that meaning navigation sort of dance. That's and there's still a lot of, um, let's say, uh, art in how we apply that because it's not clear that that's going to be computable even unless we're taking certain heuristics and slicing the problem up into a nicely, uh, I mean, the example here is if my mind went to all the nth order implications of something you said, I would never be able to utter the next sentence back. To That's me, right. Right. That's right. And if we let our computers do the same thing, I anticipate something similar. That's right. It's just like, you know, when the game, uh, when the computer plays go, it has to make a move at some point. That's right. Consider all 34 trillion moves before it actually does something. Right. Yeah. And it's therefore got to make the best guess or the best, you know, response that it can at any given moment. And from my perspective, this is actually the, the, I don't know, the value of these kinds of systems. It's not that they get the right answer. It's that when they get the wrong answer, we are able to experience it as painful or as problematic and can go, oh, that sucked, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and that can inform the system, whether it's an artificial one or the next person who's coming in to go, oh, don't go to that guy for a haircut, right? right. So all that signaling is is used at this layer as well, I guess right. would be the, the way to frame it. Right. So signaling, again, you know, is, is a way that uh, in your mind, I would map that to feedback loops, you know, learning, uh, iteration, bootstrapping, you know, those are the kind of words that I would use that you know, perhaps I don't find in your uh, dictionary. Uh, and that's why, in my mind, just recognizing and making explicit this phenomenon is what Wikipedia is all about. 
In fact, the fun part of Wikipedia is to carry multiple meanings and multiple definitions until we find out which particular combination of things is useful. Yeah. And that's a kind in of- In what context? Yeah, in a particular context. Right. Yeah. And we yeah. could have the same term over here, the same term over there, like completion, right? And what does completion mean in a programming context versus in a, let's say, emotional relationship context? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> right? There's an example. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that's, that's uh, one set of things. Um, I don't know how much of, I mean, I've been peppering you with a lot of stuff, so uh, I apologize for just spamming you. Yeah, how did you, so... Um, what was your path into this stuff, Sam? Ah, so how did you How right. did you wind up here? And it's and, and, and I, let me let me start with what are the scars? What are the emotional scars from your childhood? <laughs> no, no, I had a perfect childhood. No, let's just get <laughs> actually. So let me say, um, let me start not necessarily from my childhood, although you know later on we can go back there uh, because sure. I think it is relevant. But let's say the first significant thing I want to talk about is. Um, after I got a math degree at Stanford and I then went into software, after about, let's say, 11 years in a software business where I was actually having a lot of fun building a lot of high tech stuff because at those times, the military industrial complex had a lot of money. Okay? <laughs> right, out of, right out of college, I went to go work for a TRW and I actually ended up, um, the only unfortunate thing about it is I couldn't write about it. But since it was all classified, I was putting together the very first systems that actually had documentation in the form of text and papers and relational databases and geographic information systems and vector-based mapping and raster-based mapping and overhead sensor data and electronic intelligence information and imagery and blah, 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 and soil type and slope information and terrain information and road networks and... Uh, Let's see, uh, temperature and salinity and depth. And I was building kind of the ultimate system. And in fact, this was going to be the Navy's uh, basically model of the entire world. Okay, so that's yeah. the kind of stuff I was working on yeah. in the 80s and early 90s. So I had access to all kinds of technology, all kinds of money. I mean, I, I managed more money back then than I have, you know, access to now. Okay. Now. The interesting thing is that led me into building what today would be called a hypertext system. You click on things, you drill into it, you bring up other information, you can do this with text. So in the early 90s, in fact, it was 91, my senior engineer said, hey, there's this guy over here called uh, Doug uh, Engelbart. He claims to have invented hypertext. And I said, oh, great. You know, so let's uh, try and see if he wants to consult with us on this project. And it turns out that he had a three-day workshop the following March, March of 92. So John Rothermel, my engineer, and I both went to that workshop. And that changed my life. Okay, I don't know if you know who Doug is, but Doug... Um, One of my regrets is that I didn't get a chance to meet him before he passed. That, uh, I mean, I consider myself blessed that I actually was able to work very closely with Doug for quite a while. And so <clears throat> you certainly then know the litany of inventions and the innovations that he's attributed to. There's a lot that he's not even known for because it hasn't hit commercial success the way some of yeah. the other technologies have. Yeah. But anyway, the short story is he views himself as not a technologist. He did this when he was 25. He said, you know, I just got out of the Navy. I'm a Navy radio guy. I'm married. I got this nice house. What am I going to do the rest of my life? I'm 25. You know, life seems to be easy. So after much thinking, he said, well, you know, if you sort of look at the issues from a planetary scale, none of these things, and he looked at all these 15 or 16 things that the Millennium Foundation looks at, whether it's global warming or climate change, sorry, same thing, or uh, world the famine or class strife or blah, blah, blah. He said, you know, we're not going to be able to solve these unless we learn how to work with each other better. So he was in the business of trying to help us build our collective capacity to solve big problems. Yeah. He called it collective intelligence. Yeah. And that vision of how you take certain technologies and then adapt human systems, the way we interact, our values, our beliefs, our protocols, our values, and then use those to then inform the new tools that we build. 
and have those tools then co-evolve our human systems and have this double loop feedback mechanism he called human tool systems co-evolution. And his point was the, the more we do this, the more we learn and the faster we build our capability. And it's not going to be linear. It's going to be at least parabolic, if not better than that. Yeah. That vision, while kind of we accidentally fall into it, hasn't really been adopted explicitly by no. anyone. No. You know, there's a bit of a zillion people that have taken one of Doug's ideas, like the mouse, and made billions of dollars out of it. Somebody sure. else took a word processor, made billions out of it. Somebody yeah. else took uh, hypertext, made billions of dollars out of it. Somebody else took something else, but they don't actually then feed that back into the larger vision of what he cared about. The collaborative right. document editing, you name it, right? right? The mother of all demos, yeah. Exactly, right? Yeah. So ever since, you know, the word process came up with all this fancy formatting shit that essentially, you know, removed the beauty of ASCII text in that all tools could work on ASCII, but now, all of a sudden, now my filter cannot work on your uh, Word document because there's a bunch of crap in it. And that problem has just gotten worse over the last two, three, four, five decades. Okay? Yeah. So his notion was a knowledge base, a knowledge repository yeah. that was essentially a substrate for all kinds of different tools and capabilities to be built on top of it. So instead of being, you know, everything centering around the word processor and all formats feeding that, it's we have a common representation and all tools feed into that. It's a reversal of the computing model. Mm -hmm. That's just one of the implications. So he died, unfortunately, in July of 2013. Yeah. As thinking of himself as a failure because he'd failed to communicate this vision and very yeah. few people could actually appreciate it and were actually at that, you know, active trying to carry that vision forward. Yeah. Well, anyway, I and a few colleagues in 2008 put together a conference in uh, the Tech Museum in San Jose called Program for the Future. And it was the 40th anniversary of the mother of all demos. So we had pretty much everybody who was anybody was there. You know, we yeah. had Ted Nelson there, Doug came, Steve Wozniak was there. Uh, we had Peter Norvig there. We had Alan Kay there. We had uh, just everybody there. Okay? And everybody was, you know, saying, you know, what wonderful stuff. It was a nice retrospective, okay? And SRI was huge in putting that event together. Well, SRI was doing the retrospective. I was saying, I and next, because what I care about is the fact that, and I, I did an interview with Doug, by the way, you know, that year. And I said, Doug, of your vision, how much have we actually achieved towards your vision? He said, 3.2%. And I said, isn't that sad? It's been 40 years. Now, in 2010, I did the second of those conferences, and I asked him the very same question in 2010. I said, Doug, it's, it's been two years. You know, how much have we achieved? He said 3.6%. And of course, he's a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but at that point, I then said, Doug, I'm going to spend the rest of my cycles of my life working on this vision. So I committed to him. But that's what I've been doing, okay? So ever since then, I've been gathering uh, some people, and now I have about a half a dozen such people. I have uh, Dino Kerbeg in Oslo. I have David Price in London. I have um, Alexander Laszlo in Buenos Aires. I have um, Frode Hegland, who is from Norway, but now lives in London. I've got Stan Gould in Denver. I know Stan. Uh, you know Stan? Mm -hmm. I have uh, Annette Gratov in uh, Vienna. I have Leah McVie, and I don't even know what city she's in. You know, I just talked to her on Skype. Uh, so I've, I've collected a group of people. And so of them, anywhere around three or four of them are on a conversation with me at 6 o'clock in the morning, six days a week. So I have these calls Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We skip Saturdays. So Sunday is about what can we do immediately? What can we actually build? And the, then the project that Foda and I are doing is something called Time Browser. And Time Browser is basically a way to take real events and make them immersive experiences for kids in the future. Mm -hmm. So imagine if Time Browser had been around a couple hundred years ago, I'd be able to sit you in front of Abraham Lincoln and he would be saying four score seven years ago and you'd be right there experiencing that. Mm -hmm. Now, imagine that kind of technology applied to meetings, you know, like our meeting today, or mm -hmm. even our meetings at six o'clock in the morning, or even, you know, the board meeting that sometimes, you know, you might be called to attend, or the latest, you know, whatever scrum session you have, right? <clears throat> now, 
we do have notes and we believe that that's the best you know result that comes out of these meetings but what we don't get is uh charlie spoke over uh, sam over there and sam never got to speak in that meeting that was never recorded right mm -hmm. or the fact that uh we devoted five minutes to that particular topic but there's these seven strands of thought that never were addressed because you know they couldn't be addressed in those five minutes right mm -hmm. so <clears throat> the fact that you know reality is basically subject to who controls the power structure of the meeting and who controls the output of that meeting. And yet there's so much left that is unmined. So that if you're really looking at team dynamics and team effectiveness, you really want to look at how do we make better decisions together rather than following this 140, 150 year old document called Robert's Rules of Order. You know, yeah. you've got technology that's, you know, improving double the capacity every 18 months, and yet we're still operating our boards of uh, companies using this 140 year old set of practices. And it's not been evolved much beyond that, you know? Yeah. Revision of it, yes, I'm, I'm aware of it, but you know, that's still largely the way things are run. Yeah. And we think that that's, that's correct, okay? So the system side has certainly not evolved as fast as our tool system side, because we don't take the ability for us to look at our values, look at our practices, look at our behavior, look at our prejudices, look at our egos, and we don't look at how we can actually grow and take more advantage. I mean, Doug was, uh, one of the things he liked to say was, why do we even have the concept of a page electronically? You know, that's a paper artifact. Why don't we take these paper artifacts into the uh, digital realm and think that that's just the right way to do things? You know, that's a print-focused kind of uh, mentality. So we don't have people that think in terms of chunks of knowledge or knowledge connections. You know, we have people that still think that text on paper is the way we represent knowledge. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I could go on and on and on and on about this, but you know, you're asking my hit, my, how I got into this. Yeah. I got into this because I, I think that this idea of human systems, tool systems, co-evolution is underappreciated. I think this vision is underappreciated. So I wrote a, a letter to Doug, which I will dig up at some point, uh, on June 5th of 2005. And I said, Doug, you know, I understand that you were able to take us this far. I'm basically gonna try and work on how, how I can embrace and potentially extend this. And that's what led me into thinking, why do teams fail? You know, why do collaborations fail? You know, yep. why do they not scale? One of the things I uh, ran across, which is kind of a rough approximation is, uh projects don't go off track they start off track you know and so if you don't actually understand what's needed to form a team and you know form a project yeah it's, actually, it's gonna you know reveal the fact that you were off track to begin with so anyway I'm the, to, the the bad dna will express itself soon enough exactly those proteins will actually get created <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yep. Or, or lack of proteins, right? I did an interview a, a few months ago, and it actually just came out this last week. I haven't, I haven't shared it on social media or anything, but I, I got interviewed by um, Kevin Kelly, uh, the founder of Wired Magazine, and uh, Mark Froenfelder, the, the founder of uh, Boing Boing. Mm -hmm. And it was a little podcast on tools. Um, and, of course, me being me... <laughs> Uh, you're supposed to bring four tools, right, that you use and you think that use, like their, their audience would be uh, able to make use of. And usually it's like, you know, a, a tool for quilting or, you know, my favorite frying pan or something, you know, it's a tool. It's like makers type stuff. Yep. Uh, and I brought a couple of things that were like that or maybe one, um, but I covered four areas of my life. One was a breath hold app. I'm a big wave surfer, so it was, it was an app that helps you train for holding your breath for long periods of time. Um, the, the second tool was coherence layers <laughs> and coherence layers is my term, um, for uh, this organizing pattern in nature. It's basically how nature organizes information. Um, and, but you see it all over the place and it's, um, we can go into that in a minute. It takes a bit. Okay. The third one was pain, pain as a tool. Mm -hmm. um, pain as a really useful prioritization tool. The and then the last one was um, check-ins and check-outs. Um, and and, and check-ins and check-outs as in um, from meetings. So the four areas of my life are I'm a big wave surfer, I'm a political philosopher, I'm a privacy advocate, 
and I am an innovation consultant. But innovation consultant, what does that really mean? Like, what do I really work on? I help teams, like you said, work on social process, figure out purpose for their organization, figure out values, but really figure out ways of operating on a day in day out basis that are healthy and are building of trust and use like, I would, I would say useful relationships, but that's a utilitarian word, right? Like strong, healthy relationships. Yes. Um, um, and, uh, and so some of the political philosophy stuff that focuses, as you said, on this big picture scale, it's all the same shit on that scale too. And um, that's kind of fortunate because that's what subsidizes all this other work, that and some Airbnb. <laughs> <laughs> <Money. Nice. laughs> more airbnb money than the consulting stuff as of late I've been, <laughs> I've been busy on the on the political philosophy front mm-hmm. and, uh, and on the being depressed and and suffering from writer's block front mm-hmm. but um uh yeah i'm right there with you and and art and eric have a similar vision um though instead of talking about it with spirals they talk about it with a ladder right and it's that you you don't get to just move up one side the tools is one side of the ladder and understanding basically consciousness and awareness is another side of the ladder and you're able to build some tools but if you don't bring consciousness up to another level and by that, I really think what's meant is, oh, with those tools, we can do these other things. We see new possibilities that are available to us. Once you have that, those new ways of behaving happening, then you can build another la- level of tools that people can actually make use of. So I, I mean, got that into my model as well, right? You can see me mapping that. Totally. Absolutely. And, then, and that's why I mentioned it, right? That sounds exactly the same. Mm-hmm. Um, and... You know, the, the, I would, the only thing that feels tragic about Doug's life was that, um, like you and me, he could see so clearly what was possible that he felt a duty to make it a reality. And he wasn't able to make it a reality sufficiently to ma- match his vision within his own lifetime. Even though he doesn't realize what a humongous step he took for us. Absolutely, right? Like, we are light years ahead of where we were when he started. Right. Uh, really significantly because of him, right? Like, yeah. I mean, you know Alan Kay's uh, comment about Doug. Are you familiar with what Alan Kay said? No, what did Alan say? He said, Silicon Valley is still working mostly off of Doug's vision. They have not really truly innovated beyond that. Yeah. But multimedia, links, you know. Yeah. That's uh, from 1968. Exactly. You know? Yeah. It was yeah. conceived before 1968. You know? like, so that was just when he shared it with the rest of the world. That's right. Yeah. Now, what I'd like to uh, hypothesize is, and this is the challenge I'm putting forward to my colleagues and myself, is we've got three years before 2018. Hmm three years before the 50th anniversary of the MOAD. So what we're saying is, imagine if Doug had continued getting funding, whether from DARPA or from other sources. Suppose he got 100 million or whatever it turned out to be, and that his team had uh, stayed intact. What would we actually imagine he could have given us? You know, rather than his team splitting for SRI and him basically you know, going to timeshare, you know? Yeah. And that's the challenge that I'm posing to my colleagues. And unfortunately, we're not in possession of uh, $100 million worth of uh, funding. So we're just doing with meager uh, resources what small things we can. And that's why Time Browser is step number one. So I've got a, I've got a question for you. And, and I'll, I'll, I've got two questions. Yep. And I'll sort of like title them and then maybe we can dive into them. But okay. All right. the first one is um, business models. Yeah. And then the, oh, maybe I lost the second one. Um, Yeah. Oh, yeah. The second one is you had talked about, you know, rather than text documents or the word processor being the center thing, like this knowledge repository being the central thing. And um, 
my hunch is that that knowledge repository being the central thing is that that's the vision because of the interoperability that gets gained there. Right. So there's a lot of it that's based in uh, extensibility, among shareability, among persistence, among ubiquity. There's a lot of aspects to it. Yes. Yeah. Here, I'm going to adjust my little screen thing here. Yeah. Oh. Sorry. Um, I'm going to want to explore that specifically more with you later um, because while I'm interested in, I want to facilitate as much of that collaboration as, I don't know, how, let me frame this a different way. I want to remove as much friction, as much tool-based friction from those forms of interoperability, of collaboration as I can. Yeah. Um, but I, at the same time, see there being, um, um, my understanding of how innovation works and how privacy and the relationship between that and privacy, um, and the ability to constrain the size of a risk, right? If I can try something in a private space and nobody else is going to find out about it, I, I'm willing to try some more crazy stuff than if I'm on stage. Um, for me, that ends up meaning that you, you, you end up with an architecture that isn't, you know, a single, at least not a single public repository, right? And I think that probably maps to your vision, but I just wanted to kind of throw that on the table. So that, that still brings in uh, nuggets of this trust, this community, this uh, control aspect, which I think we have to properly understand the role of fear. And fear, of course, is underlying all risk. And right now we have a society where the default is we manage risk. And then we figure out, okay, so despite that, what can I do? And I'd like to invert that model. I'd like to invert that model to first start with, geez, what's possible? And then, oh, by the way, how do we manage risk? It's a, I, I would like to propose that as a different way of thinking. Do you... Um... Can we, can we go into that a little bit? Cause, cause I, I, I just, I would, I, yeah. I find that to be attractive. And at the same time, I, I, uh, um, a part of me goes, mm, that's not how nature, that's not how, that's not how human works. nature works. Yes. Especially if you study the law. I, I don't think it's just human nature. Like I think that this yeah. is natural systems period. Okay. So this is, this is definitely fascinating because yeah. I think that we're definitely on an evolutionary trajectory. Yeah. And the evolutionary trajectory, and this is broad brush because, you know, I do have to return a call in about 10, 15 minutes. Sure, sure. Is, That's good. We'll, we'll keep this thing somewhat short. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, there's a lot of touch points, and this is not going to be the last time we talk, I'm sure. No. And that is that we have to figure out in what way we deserve to keep growing. And that is how we actually get beyond our fears into our potentials and our possibilities. Now, while we're living just with the, the amygdala brain, okay, we're all entirely fear driven. Yeah. We are given this frontal cortex because we have that opportunity. Nature has given us an opportunity to go beyond our fears. What we haven't figured out yet, yet is, are we up to the task? Okay. So, one of my views is there are certain tools we're being given for the very first time, and we're not the first civilization that's been on this planet. You know, we're probably the dozenth or more, you know, civilization that's had a chance, and all the other ones have managed to not overcome their complexities. But we have an opportunity, just as all the others did, and arguably we may have a tool or set of tools, whether it's nanotechnology or whether it's internet or whether it's you know, uh, genetic uh, uh, replacement, whatever. We yeah. have tools that we believe the other civilizations didn't have. But the question I would pose is, given that these tools are so powerful and so full of potentials, what are the chances that we figure out how to use it right the first time? <laughs> right? Yeah. But it's a responsibility, okay? Yeah. It's a privilege and it's a responsibility. And if we're fear-driven, we're going to go one way with it. 
if we're potential driven, we're going to go another way, but we have to manage the risk. Yeah. Risk cannot go away. We cannot be naive and think that, oh, everybody's well-intentioned. Okay. You've just told me essentially what I believe, but rather than saying, let's start first in a protective, very safe, very risk averse way, I'd rather focus first on what is possible. What do we need to do to make ourselves happy, survivable, resilient, anti-fragile, blah, blah, blah. And then look at, okay, so how do we handle the sociopathic or pathological cases, you know, sure. in, uh, in society? And I think that would give us a whole lot more enjoyable life rather than living in a police state or living under, you know, these tomes of law that, you know, basically yep. take tons to print, you know, and nobody sure. reads sure. all the law, right? And aren't actually, I mean, so much of the legal system is a fiction, right? Like, right. nobody actually knows all the laws that they're supposed to follow. Not to mention all the pork. You know, yeah. and all the, you know, yeah. special interests. Regulatory capture. Not all. to mention corruption. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So anyway, there's a, there's a lot of conversations here. Well, I, to, just, but, but without going into the, without going into the, you know, the failings of our existing governance system and just talking about fear, um, for me, this really is, it goes back to the progressive trust stuff, right? And it's, the way the way I framed it to somebody at a dinner a while ago was um, this comes back to this concept of coherence layers that I haven't actually dove into yet. Coherence layers are it's um, a layer of abstraction. Uh, how do I frame this? In nature, you usually see a coherence layer. Uh, and you recognize it through the fact that a boundary gets crossed, right? So you have a membrane, you have a cell, and the li life inside of that cell is different from life outside of that cell, okay. right? Mm -hmm. And that cell, that organism, is a coherence layer. There's an orderliness to it. It's, it's an orderliness that is different from the, the order outside of that cell. You could say it's something of, that has an identity? It could, yeah, it could, although... Although you can, so you can have coherence layers in the physical world, like a cell or an organism or a, a company, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, but you can also have uh, coherence layers in sort of the conceptual world. All of the white objects on the table, you know, all of the, all of the women in the room, whatever, right? Like, so you can start dividing things in, in specific ways and knowledge management systems obviously um, make use of this because this is, this becomes different ways of filtering and synthesizing information. For me, the, the interesting thing about coherence layers when it comes to knowledge management systems is, um, is just that, right? Like you're able to take a bunch of signals and then transform them into something that is more useful. And that's actually the role that coherence layers or any organism plays in an ecosystem as well. It's not why they do their job, right? They're just there doing a thing. But the reason that they're able to survive and are still there is usually because they transform some set of resources into another set of resources that is useful to others that also help them survive. There's this collaborative, positive feedback loop, basically, um, that enables that set of organisms that are participants in that collaboration to do a better job of making use of the resources when they enter their stream than other sets of organisms are able to. If you have one individual organization organism that's not able to collaborate with others, yes, it gets some food, but it doesn't alter the terrain in ways that are able to benefit it and give it more food. Mm -hmm. If these guys are, they end up eventually pushing it off to the side mm -hmm. and dominating the landscape. And so the... I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but to just finish that little trailhead of thought, um, that's where the collaborative advantage concept came from for me. I was at a, a sharing economy conference. I realized that there was going to be, this was the mesh conference that Lisa Gansky put on a few years ago. It's kind of like the first coming together, all the sharing economy companies mm -hmm. um, here in the U S and I realized coming out of that conference that there was going to be a lot of political backlash and, and I worried that some of that backlash was going to come in the form of if we share, then it'll take away jobs. Right. And, uh, the, the, I basically went, we need a, this is a complex thing that we're trying to describe here. And we need a slogan that's as simple as big government is bad. 
right? Big government is bad is something that the, the conservative um, arm of the Republican Party um, created as an ad campaign, basically, mm -hmm. to describe a really complex set of theories around bureaucracy and government versus private enterprise, et cetera, right? I wanted something similar, and the, and the concept that I came, the tagline I came up with was collaborative advantage. Okay. And so that was, the, and the concept of collaborative advantage is kind of in line with all of your life's work from what I'm hearing, and that is the biggest advantage, the biggest innovation or impact that any community can have is an innovation that improves their ability to collaborate. Right. It improves their ability to build upon one another's efforts and insights. Mm -hmm. it improves their ability to steer, to know who to turn to and who not to turn to. Right. That's an important part of collaboration as well. Great. So. I know you got to jump onto a call in just a minute. No, no. Because uh, what I wanted to tag that notion to is the COI idea, the community of impact idea. Yeah. Because that's uh, the area where, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to, figure out can we create this circle of trust within which we're relatively transparent, relatively high integrity, relatively collaborative, relatively collegial, you know, relatively uh, informal. Right. Yeah. And so I'm looking for a set of practices and principles that when you self opt in, you say, yep, I want to find others like that. And I want to, you know, work with them. And we ourselves start with small cells of like-minded people who are looking for other cells to connect with. The other notion here is that rather than a centrally controlled society where let's say I'm dependent on welfare or I'm dependent on the tax you know, benefits of blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I'm at, yeah, how can I get 150 people who care about whether or not I'm gonna starve tonight? Yep. How can I you know, build that around so that you know, I'm looking at everybody else in the same way, right? Yeah. Then we have a strong fabric to society so that if there's a rupture somewhere, it's relatively self-melding and so relatively quick, but it's not going to take you know several calls to nine one one or several calls to you know yeah. FEMA or several calls to you know the uh, CPS or whatever to get something yeah. done. You know, we yeah. ourselves ought to have local resources, local strengths. We ought to have all the structures of a cell everywhere in the body. Yep. You know, you don't just have chlorophyll in one part of the tree. You know, you don't just have mitochondria in one part of the body. Yep. You know, you have to distribute. It's holographic. It is, it is everywhere. And so really, at the end of the day, what you're talking about is rebuilding community, mm -hmm. right? And I think that what we're really talking about when we, when we get excited about the tools side is, hey, how can we build tools that augment our natural community building ways yeah. and enable us to do that, those Similar patterns, but not necessarily exactly the same, but similar things at larger scales. Yes. Because we operate at larger scales, right? Um, yes. The last piece, um, business models. <laughs> I am interested in figuring out ways to um, build small things that provide value for others who may not be interested in this vision at all, right? But are interested in, in a problem that we happen to solve. And using the awareness and the resources that come out of that to bootstrap the next layer. Um, so. So this is interesting because uh, you go to business models and I have to admit, okay, I'm not a good person that you know, has come up with anything new here, but let me tell you a story. Okay, and that is, I know one of the founders of a very, very successful multi-billion dollar company. Okay, that person's been one of the founding team members of that company for at least two, if not three decades. Uh, probably has no need to work ever again in their lives, but they're now a managing partner along with their other co-founders of this company of a venture firm, as you might, might guess. So they're managing, you know, nine figures worth of assets, you know, trying to invest in new technology. So I went to this person and said, this notion of social good, the social entrepreneurship, you know, these, uh, these B corporations that are set aside by the government to say, you know, you can actually not be solely looking at the bottom line, but suppose you have double or triple bottom lines that you're looking at. What, what are the VC implications? You know, do you fancy yourself getting involved in these kind of things? And he took a look at me and said, 
what's a B Corp? And so I gave him the one-liner on that. And his one-liner was, my investors would not be interested. Nope, not at all. That to me is such a sad state of affairs. Yeah, I, I went around, when we were looking at how to structure our company, I went and talked to a bunch of different folks, including, um, I'm blanking on the guy's name, but from Union Square Ventures, one of the founders of Union Square Ventures. Mm-hmm. And um, basically the feedback I got was, it's too exotic. Uh, from from, the, from the, the venture capital side, they were like, eh, we, there's too much wiggle room for the management team. It's not clear what the priorities are, really. Um, and then even from the foundation side, people who would be giving grants, they were like, we don't see it as a plus. And so it was just, no, that's, it's a useful marketing thing for selling to cus- consumers, but it's not really something for structuring relationships between investors yet. It's not something that, that it assists you. It's something that's useful for communicating how you are going to run your organization. Mm-hmm. But the conclusion that I've come to long ago, and this is the same with Arthur and Eric, is you don't want to touch VC money because they're not building on the same, they're not building on a shared um, understanding with us about what it is that we're trying to accomplish. Right, exactly. They're looking to cash out. We're not looking to cash out. We're looking to grow. Um, we're playing like the infinite game. It's the infinite game. That's right. That's we're right. We're, tra- we're wanting to play an infinite game. Yeah. So basically I'm looking at um, bootstrap business models. Right. And then the last piece, I know you got to run, but um, on that community of impact, there's something similar I've been wanting to do for a while called collaborative. Um, I do think community of impact is a uh, more focused uh, on active practitioners community. Collaborative in my mind is actually a different thing. It is a more, um, I was trying to figure out a way to enable a much broader community of people to to have a light touch on this, to to start to participate in ways that we're not, you know, I will commit my life to this thing, you know, types of commitment. Um, And and that was, you know, basically events and bringing in actors and musicians and storytellers and thought leaders like yourself or the John C. Lee Browns of the world, whatever, right? Like, and and, um, getting... For me, that, that whole thing is really about getting this whole concept of a different regulatory system and the tools and process, the social processes that are emerging to foster that, making that not something that's happening in the shadows um, with a bunch of you know, folks just like us, but instead something that becomes a movement. Mm-hmm. And so about a year ago, I kind of realized, okay, that's, that's actually what's next up for mm-hmm. me. That's probably the, the best suited thing for me. Although it feels like a daunting task, right? For me, there's fear there. That's, that's, that's scary. Um, and, um, but I do feel like it's the right thing to go do is, is to start pulling in a broader community to, into that conversation. Well, that's what I would like to create with the COI idea, is that any individual, when faced with this daunting task that says, oh, geez, am I going to jump off this cliff and do this thing that, you know, I just high risk. I want to know there's 150 people behind me and below me who are going to catch me if I stumble or if I fall. And that's the sense in which I want us to have residents. Because if we can do this, take this uh, example, for example, Uh, Bernie. Right. I don't know what your feelings are on Bernie, but let's suppose, you know, he or somebody like him, even Hillary, okay, uh, says, I want to help change the country and I want to take it into a different direction. He can't do it by himself. No. We've got, you know, 86% of the Congress that needs to be replaced, you know, and where are those people? You know, there needs to be kind of a Sanders party if he's going to get anything done. Yeah. He's got a whole network of other people who are going to support the different layers of activity that need to be done on the national as well as the local tactical level. Yeah. So that, that movement, I think, is not going to be uh, something that he's going to say, okay, Matt, you're going to take District 17, and Sam, you're going to take District 29. I mean, it's not going to come top down. We yeah. have to sort of say, hey, here we are. You know, I believe in this. And we're yeah. going to build this network, and we're going to build this new uh, community that is highly resonant this way. Yeah. You know? 
I will give you my, my quick summary on Bernie. Yep. I think he seems like a man of integrity. And I think he actually runs counter to the visions that you and I are interested in. Uh, that's enough. another possibly interesting conversation there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we can go into that later. And, and, that, and that's just because he's really accustomed to using the toolkit of government. And so he's looking at really strengthening that yep. structure. Um, and so from that perspective, I actually think Hillary would be, I'm looking at this from a strategic, okay, hey, if we're rolling out big change over the next few years, mm -hmm. Who are the people that would be most amenable to that in government? And I think yep. that's actually probably a Hillary, because the I think one that gets two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars in appearance at Goldman Sachs. That one, that Hillary. <laughs> that Hillary. Um, okay, yeah, that's another interesting conversation then. Yeah, yeah. I, not that I think she's a great person. I just think her um, her political leanings um, tend more towards free market stuff, and our stuff actually is pretty free market ish even though we don't think money, like mm -hmm. I, I doubt you and I would, I, I doubt you would describe yourself as a libertarian, right? We need that conversation. We okay. That conversation. okay. Because I'm probably closer to a libertarian than a Clinton, a Clinton Okay. I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. I'm with you. But for me, the, the problem with liber, the libertarian stuff is it pretends as if markets and money communicate all the signals. No, that it's they it's and they don't. Yeah. See, here's where John Nash comes in, okay? I think John mm. Nash's fundamental assumption in economics is, is faulty. Mm. They're not fundamentally only selfish. Totally. You know, totally. and that model relies on us being completely selfish. And unfortunately, those of us who are not selfish end up losing in this game if we're assumed to all be selfish. And that's the fallacy of the John Nash-based economic model. Yeah. There needs to be an evolution in that model. So. Yeah. Well, and that's happening in the behavioral economics stuff. People are realizing. Not enough. Not enough. Not enough but it, it's Not coming. Enough. It's coming. We'll talk more about that too because I, yeah. I, I have uh, my own theories there on um, why we evolved to be altruistic. And we'll leave it at that. Yes. That's, I mean, it touches on the responsibility and awareness and privilege notions. Yeah. Uh, yes. So cool. uh, Matt, the uh, time's really gone really quickly. And uh, so <laughs> we'll have to do it again. <laughs> we'll do it again. Um, sorry, I have to get onto this other call. I think I may actually have to give somebody a ride here soon. But uh, uh, two things. Number one, yeah. I do have this community that meets at six o'clock in the morning, California time uh, all the time. And we talk about these and related subjects. And then there's another community in Palo Alto that happens on Wednesdays at six o'clock to 8.30 that touches PM? on the PM. Okay, and uh, sometimes Redwood City, but mostly Palo Alto. Okay, and sometimes Los Altos, but mostly Palo Alto. Um, so anyway, there's possibility. Yeah, there's possibilities uh, for us to continue these and actually, you know, start interconnecting some of our networks. And Put me. Can you can you ping me with the details on both of those? Yeah. Whether okay. it's in Skype or somewhere else. Yeah. Okay. okay. Awesome. By the way, um, since you know this is on Zoom, do you have any issue with me sharing this? Would love you to share it. I would like to share it as well. Great. Then I'll put it up and uh, give you the link uh, as soon as I can, probably sometime this evening. Sounds great. Thanks so much, Sam. This is fun, Matt. Let's do it again. Definitely. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye for now.